This is the MSC Irena, the world's largest cargo ship that can hold more than 24,000 shipping containers. While it might seem like containers are placed randomly all over the ship, like some messed up adult version of Jenga, this could not be further from the truth. In fact, the engineering behind how ships like her get loaded is so insane that one wrong move could mean the ship ends up at the bottom of the ocean. 83 containers have already gone overboard. It looks like this one's next. Despite its relatively simple design, the lowly shipping container is the literal blood coursing through the veins of international trade routes. At either 20 or 40 feet long, these containers can hold about 30 tons of whatever you want. But despite the seemingly obvious idea of putting everything into the same size box to maximize space and cut down on time, that was not the case until relatively recently. In fact, the most modern shipping container as we know it didn't exist until 1968, when an organization committed to promoting efficiency in all areas, known as the International Standards Organization, or ISO, championed the idea. Before the publication of ISO 668 that established requirements for shipping containers, people used to ship things in what was called break bulk shipping. An easy way to think of break bulk shipping is how you might organize your garage. Stack these boxes here and put those oblong boxes over there next to a couple of bags of Christmas ornaments. Oh, and your big clunky lawnmower is kind of in the center of the garage, getting in the way of everything. How ships used to be packed is pretty similar to this. The people paying for the items to be shipped would deliver them in whatever box, barrel, bag, or pallet they wanted. This, in turn, was a nightmare for the port since tons of labor was needed to individually pick up, place, and haul out each item. That was until 1956. That year, Malcolm McLean, the owner of one of the largest trucking companies in the United States, had an amazing idea. Because the time required to load and unload ships was the biggest factor in high shipping costs, he thought of an idea where a truck could just drive up to a port, have its load picked up by a crane, and then put onto the ship. Offloading would just work in reverse. Soon enough, McLean's idea turned the entire shipping industry on its head. After McLean's invention became commonplace, the time it took to unload a 10,000-ton cargo ship went from 10 to 15 days down to around two days. The price to ship a ton of goods went from about $5.86 per ton down to a measly 16 cents that it is today. Damage and theft of ship goods also decreased by about 90%, while space utilization increased to 70% more. But loading these shipping containers is not as easy as stacking a bunch on deck and heading out to sea. In fact, the science behind loading these containers is so detailed and precise that one mistake could literally cause the ship to keel over. Although the shipping containers all look the same, why does it matter so much where they're placed? The short answer to that is physics. Though the maximum weight of each container is around 30 tons, that doesn't mean each one is stuffed to the brim with 30 tons of goods. In fact, one container could have 30 tons of, say, nails, while the other one next to it could be stuffed with Elvis costumes. The one next to it could have the latest shipment of Black Ops 6 video games destined for the US market. Although you may want to see that particular container fall overboard, the ship's crew definitely does not so they have a detailed plan to ensure each container goes in its right spot. But instead of trying to hand jam everything onto a paper chart, crews rely on advanced software to help them decide on what goes where. This software is absolutely critical for shipping companies that without it, they could literally sink the ship. The sponsor of today's video, Odoo, while not focusing on ship stability, provides an equally critical software that can help your business from sinking. If you're an entrepreneur or business owner, you know that having a website is crucial to your success. But what if I told you there's a way to create a stunning, professional website without spending a dime? That's where today's sponsor, Odoo, comes in. Odoo is an all-in-one business management software that offers a range of applications for entrepreneurs, including a powerful website builder. And the best part about it, besides being super easy to use, is that your first application is free for life. 
This means no matter how long the site is set up, you'll get unlimited hosting and support. Odoo will even throw in a custom domain name for free for the first year. Creating your website with Odoo is incredibly simple. With their intuitive website configurator, you can build a modern, professional website in just a few clicks. Define your goals, choose your colors or logo, add the pages you need, and pick your theme. You can even use their brand new ChatGPT copyright integration to further enhance your website. No technical skills required. Just drag and drop, and you'll have a fully functional, gorgeously designed website in minutes. So if you're ready to take your business to the next level, head over to odoo.com and start building your free website today. And now let's dive back into how the crew comes up with a plan to safely stack thousands of containers. Although it goes by various names like load plan, a cargo plan, or a bay plan, the basic premise is the same. On board each ship, there is a designated computer that has software designed to help the crew plan how to pack thousands of containers as efficiently and safely as possible. But how does the computer tell its operators where to put each container? The best way to answer that is to look at a model. Perhaps the best model would be the largest container ship in the world, the MSC Irina. With the ability to carry almost 25,000 20-foot equivalent units, or TEUs, the Irina can haul enough cargo to supply a small nation in one trip. With the ability to carry this amount of cargo, this ship is the pinnacle of cargo handling technology. With this particular ship having a length of around 1,312 feet, we can infer that it has around 24 bays. A bay, in the sense of shipping cargo, is the vertical sections of the ship from its bow or front that go towards the stern or rear of the vessel. The easiest way to picture a bay is to imagine drawing a line from the bottom of the ship and that line going up into space above the deck edge of the ship since each bay includes what is stored both above and below the deck. Bays are numbered from 01 to the last number in line, which is usually no more than 24. Odd bays are designed to fit 20-foot containers, while even bays accommodate 40-foot ones. But the calculations don't stop there. Inside of each bay are what are called rows. The rows are measured from center line or middle of the ship. Along the center line of each bay, the row number is double zero. For rows to port or left of center line are even numbers, while those to right or starboard are odd. But inside of each bay, there is more than just one set of rows. Considering that the Irina is about 98 feet deep from its deck edge to the keel. With a standard height of 8.5 feet, there can be about eight of what are called tiers in each row. The tiers are measured from the bottom up. Inside the ship, the tiers would go from 01 to 08, which is closest to the deck edge. On top of the deck, the numbering of the tiers would start at the height of the deck and go up from there. On the weather decks, a ship of this size could safely stack another seven to 10 tiers of containers. However, planning how to stack these containers takes more into account than just weight. In fact, another important consideration is the final destination. Contrary to popular belief, very few ships just go straight from one port to another. While some shipping lines do this, the vast majority of shipping lines circumnavigate continents and sometimes even the world. Take, for example, our sample ship again. This type is most common with ships coming out of Asia, like China, Japan, and South Korea. Say a ship leaves China fully loaded with gifts intended for the U.S. consumer market for the Christmas season and a ton of agricultural chemicals. The ship will go from China to South Korea, where it will take on a load of, say, indestructible Nokia phones and Samsung TVs. The ship would then go to a port like Los Angeles, where it would discharge its consumer goods before heading up to Oakland, California. This port, known for its focus on agricultural products, is where the ship would offload its agricultural chemicals while onloading produce. The ship would then head to a country like Japan, which needs to import much of its food from countries like the U.S. After offloading in Japan, the ship would pick up many products Chinese businesses need, like automotive parts, semiconductors, and tools. The ship would then go back to China to restart the process. During this journey, the crew not only needs to account for the weight of each container, but also needs to consider the destination. Going back to our example, if the ship had all the agricultural chemicals loaded last back in China, 
This would cause a ton of delays in Los Angeles since all of that product would need to be offloaded. The cargo meant for Los Angeles unloaded and then reload the Oakland-bound cargo. Because of this, ships will often load cargo kind of like an onion, where the more distant ports of call have their cargo centered line and down, while those coming up sooner have their tiers more readily accessible. Although saving time and money by not wasting it loading and unloading cargo when it doesn't need to be done is a major factor, crews must also consider several safety considerations that, if not done properly, could quite literally sink the ship. With stacks of containers going up as much as 100 feet in the air, one of the most obvious things crews must consider is weight distribution. While I won't bore you with a crash course in naval architecture, it is important to understand the various weights of the containers will play a factor in a ship's stability. Because the construction of each ship is different, either its basic dimensions, where large equipment like the engines are located, or how fuel tanks are dispersed throughout the ship, each ship has precise calculations for determining its weight distribution. As a general rule, the higher up on a ship, the less weight can be placed since this will disproportionately affect the ship's center of gravity. Due to this, cargo like chemical fertilizer should be at the bottom of the ship, while the Elvis costumes need to stay at the top. And if you don't think this is a big deal, there have been several mishaps in recent years, like the MV Golden Ray in 2019 or the MV Hogue Osaka in 2015. Incorrect cargo placement was a direct cause of both their groundings when the crew lost control of the ship. Crews also need to consider the type of goods inside the container. Because cargo ships can essentially carry anything, it is quite common for ships to carry multiple kinds of hazardous materials on the same voyage. The ISO has classified these hazardous materials into different classes, such as explosives, oxidizers, gases, flammable liquids, corrosive substances, and several others. Because some of these hazardous materials do not play well together, the ISO has mandated that hazardous cargo be labeled and segregated appropriately from other materials that could cause an accidental chain reaction. For example, containers holding flammable liquids must be far from those holding oxidizers or explosives. Corrosives, which can potentially eat through their shipping containers, have to be a safe distance from containers with flammable liquids and oxidizers. To help crews do this, the ISO has published stowage charts that the ship's loading computer has installed, alerting the crew if a certain container cannot go in that slot for safety reasons. In fact, there are a ton of hidden variables the crew must consider that, if not followed correctly, have literally sent ships to the bottom of the ocean before. When looking at giant stacks of containers on top of a cargo ship, it seems like a miracle that they don't tip over. A series of ingenious yet simple devices prevent them from falling over despite even the worst sea conditions. If you look at the corner of each shipping container, you'll see that each end has a slot that can fit something inside of it. In each of these corners, workers can put what are called twist locks into them. A twist lock is basically a metal housing that holds a triangle-shaped cone. When inserted into the corner casting, the worker will pull down a lever that will rotate the lock 90 degrees. After this occurs, the corner of that container is now securely fastened and will not budge until the lever is pulled up again. The next part of the securing process is what are called lashings. If you were walking on deck of a large container ship ready to put to sea, you would notice that there are these large metal X-type devices on the lower tiers of containers. These devices are called lashings and are another critical component of securing a shipment for sea. The way lashings work is that a worker or crew member will attach them to each top corner and connect them to the deck in a diagonal pattern. Normally, only the tier directly on deck will have lashings, but larger ships could potentially have the first two or three tiers with lashings. These lashings are important because of physics. While the twist locks in each corner will secure the stacks of containers vertically so they all move in one unit, the lashings help prevent lateral movement of the stack. As ships transit through the ocean, there are a ton of external factors pushing on the container stacks, whether it's the wind, the ship rolling from the waves, or the inertia of moving the ship left or right. These sky-high container stacks are at great risk of keeling over and not coming back up. The last part of this three-tiered safety process is the use of turnbuckles. 
Turnbuckles are the devices towards the end of the lashing rod that look like they have two screws in them and two bars on either side. The turnbuckle helps crew members tighten the lashings to the deck while in transit. With one end connected to the lashing bar and the other to the deck fitting, the turnbuckle is the last crucial step to ensuring that the lashings maintain the proper tension no matter the sea conditions. Because of innovations like these, shipping huge numbers of containers has become safer, faster, and cheaper than ever before. These factors have caused the shipping industry to respond in a couple of ways that will shape the course of humankind for generations to come. When computerized shipping first became mainstream, the largest container ships carried no more than 2,500 TEUs of cargo. By the 1980s, the shipping industry decided to make even bigger ships, Panamax ships, designed to be the maximum size allowed in the Panama Canal these ships could hold around 4,500 TEUs. From the 1980s to the present day, each generation of ship class continues to get bigger and bigger. By 2013, a new class of ship called the ultra-large container ship could move an astounding 21,000 TEUs, which has since been dwarfed by the mega container ship class, which is now pushing almost 25,000 TEUs. The shipping industry has pushed for bigger and bigger ships because of the economy of scale. With more cargo able to be carried at a time, the shipping industry has now become a heavily monopolized business, where the top five companies, like Maersk and MSC, control roughly two-thirds of all global trade. While having a handful of ships that haul a good chunk of the world's trade ensures low cost and a faster arrival of goods, there are downsides to having several large companies rely on these massive ships. The first of these downsides is blocking choke points. As the world saw in 2021, when a massive container ship, the Ever Given, was overtaken by strong winds in the Suez Canal and ran aground. This one ship, paralyzed the entire world's supply chain for six days until she was freed. Instances like this show that relying on a handful of super-large ships through a single area can devastate world trade. Another problem with this is when trade wars ensue. Although President-elect Trump has not taken office yet, the proposed tariffs he wants to impose on foreign countries, especially China, would have disastrous effects on the shipping industry. One of the first trickle-down effects would be a temporary decline in global trade that could last months or years. This is because of the huge amount of infrastructure needed to load and unload shipping containers and accommodate these massive ships. Contrary to popular belief, these massive ships cannot simply go anywhere they choose. Ports must have dredged deep enough channels for these big ships to go, and they must have built long enough piers to dock them. Once docked, there needs to be sufficient crane services on the pier and an intricate system of roads and railheads to keep the flow of cargo moving efficiently. Lastly, there needs to be sufficient human capital from stevedores, longshoremen, crane operators, and other critical jobs to ensure cargo handling operations go smoothly. Because of this, of the roughly 500 ports worldwide, only about 50 can handle ultra-large cargo carriers and above. A trade war can be devastating to the shipping industry since importers would want shippers to look elsewhere to offload their goods. However, if available ports become swamped, the industry may have to wait months or years for other ports to get their infrastructure up to par to handle them. In the meantime, the goods these ships would carry languish in warehouses while consumers become more frustrated at higher prices and empty shelves. Because of all this, while containerization has made the overall shipping industry much better, it has also made it into a precarious house of cards that, under the right conditions, could send the whole thing tumbling down. Bye for now.